welcome to Jay Coletti's Racket Reviews. My name is Jay Coletti, and I will be your hostess. Here on Racket Reviews, we are dedicated to learning about all things organized crime, and today I'm really looking forward to having a discussion with you about controversial Genovese mobster Anthony Strollo. Never considered the most loyal of mobsters, Strollo's legacy really came into question toward the end of his life. If you're enjoying the channel and would like to become a Racket Reviews patron, please head on over to that Patreon account and join the Coletti family. Now, without further ado, we have much to discuss, so let's get right to it. Antonio Strollo was born in Manhattan, New York on June 14, 1899 to Calabrian-Italian immigrant parents Leone and Giovannina Strollo. He was the youngest of three brothers. His older brothers were named Emilio and Dominic. Some reports claim that Emilio's name was actually Samuel, but Emilio does seem to be the correct name by most sources. The family lived in Greenwich Village, and Leone Strollo worked as a laborer at the time of Antonio Strollo's birth. By the early 1900s, however, he had opened up a candy store where he made a living for his family. Greenwich Village was an area densely populated with mobsters, and throughout Strollo's criminal career would be where he would remain for the most part. Although he would extend into New Jersey, but we'll talk about that in a little bit. By the time Strollo was old enough to work, he would find a job as a truck driver. While working in this legitimate job, it's likely that through the Teamsters Union rackets, Strollo would make his way into organized crime in the 1920s. It's reported that he was a bootlegger and enforcer during the 1920s for Joe Miseria, who was the boss at the time. Strollo would marry a woman named Rose at the end of the decade according to the 1930 U.S. Census. He was still listed as a truck driver at the time, but it's known that his venturing into the mob had already taken place sometime between 1920 and 1930. After 1930, it would appear that he was no longer married to Rose. The implications are unclear whether this was due to death or divorce, but what we do know is that by the end of 1932, Strollo would be married to a Jewish woman named Edna Goldenberg. The two would vacation in Bermuda for their honeymoon, returning to New York on May 25, 1932. By 1935, they were listed as having two daughters together in the census. Of course, as with all of these older mobsters, some reports do claim that he was always married to Edna and that there was no previous wife, but according to the census, that does seem to be the case. During the Castellamarese War that took place from 1930 to 1931, Strollo, after seeing which way the tides were turning, switched to Salvatore Maranzano's side, Miseria's direct rival. After his switch from Miseria to Maranzano, Lucky Luciano would soon betray Maranzano, have him killed, and take over his boss himself. It would appear that Strollo had no hard feelings about this, as he would switch right into being a Luciano Capo with no struggle whatsoever. Once in with Luciano, Strollo would become an extremely close ally of Vito Genovese. They even seemed to be friends outside of work, as Genovese would be the best man at Strollo's wedding. The alignments with Luciano and Genovese would serve Strollo well. After Luciano became the boss of the family, he promoted Vito Genovese to be his underboss, Frank Costello to Consiglieri, and Strollo was made into a capo. One of the most notable men who served under Strollo as a soldier was the famous turncoat Joe Valacci. In addition to the advancement in title, Strollo would begin enjoying the fruits of Mafia leadership when he became one of the top men in the nightclub business. He was said to control the Mafia's entire bar and nightclub scene on the east side and in Greenwich Village. He was a vital racketeer in Manhattan's west side docks, and he ran loan sharking, gambling, and bookmaking operations. On June 18, 1936, Lucky Luciano would be sentenced to 30 to 50 years behind bars for prostitution, although he would later wriggle out of the sentencing at the time it seemed like the end of Luciano's career. Once Luciano was put away, Genovese, his underboss, was made acting boss of the family. While he maintained that role, he promoted Strollo to be his underboss. When Genovese, facing a murder charge, fled to Italy to escape justice, he had hoped to have Strollo step into the role of acting boss for him. However, Genovese's family rival, Frank Costello, would take on that responsibility instead, and would even push Strollo out of the role of underboss in favor of his man, Willie Moretti. In addition to that, Costello would also remove Strollo from his precious Greenwich Village rackets. Soon, Strollo would move his family into a mansion in Fort Lee, New Jersey. Upon moving there, he would expand his mafia territory and responsibility. In New Jersey, he would take control of the Teamsters Local 560, making money through union corruption. After living in New Jersey for about a decade, Strollo would begin to flex his political muscle as well. By the early 1950s, he had major control of the Jersey City docks. Part of this was likely due to his manipulation of Mayor John V. Kinney. The men were known to have met together, and although Kinney initially tried to deny that any meeting had ever taken place, there was so much proof and evidence that the mayor would eventually have to fess up that they met on March 14, 1952. Kenny would try to explain that this meeting took place so that he could try to get Strollo to settle some of the labor disputes and conflicts that plagued Jersey City. 
You know as well as I do that what that really means is that Strollo was using labor disputes to twist the mayor's arm. It's because of Strollo's ability to bend things to meet his will that I believe he received the Mafia nickname Tony Bender. Although, I admit, I'm not quite sure, but that seems like a logical explanation. Speaking of things that I think make sense, but can't necessarily prove, it would be plausible that Strollo's nickname did inform the Futurama episode Bender Gets Made, Season 2, Episode 13, wherein one of the main characters, a robot named Bender, gets made into the robot mafia. I just want to take a moment to say that I hope you enjoy all of the mafia references in books and TV shows and movies because my mind is full of them. Anyway, back to the real Bender. He controlled the New Jersey Teamsters Local 560 in Union City, New Jersey, and is believed to have played a critical role in establishing the infamous Anthony Provenzano into the position of president of that local in 1958. Provenzano was an early ally of Jimmy Hoffa, but would later become his enemy after the two began feuding while in prison together. Back in Greenwich Village, Strollo was still out of power. By the time Genovese returned to the United States, Costello had a stranglehold on Strollo's former territory. Genovese and Strollo would work together to get Costello out. In order to weaken Costello's position, Strollo would orchestrate the murders of several Costello affiliates, including Costello himself. Strollo met with Costello for dinner at Chandler's restaurant on May 2, 1957. During this meeting, he would gather information about where Costello would be throughout the rest of his day so that he could plan the boss's assassination. Genovese had already given the order to take Costello out, and now was the time to act. An attempt on Costello's life was made that night by gunman Vincent Gigante. Gigante would miss his target, only grazing Costello's head. This was a very dangerous position for the Genovese faction to be in. Had Costello wanted, he could have called for their murders and an all-out mob war. Costello, instead, ended up giving Genovese what he wanted. Costello stepped down from leadership and didn't even bother to pursue revenge against Gigante for the murder attempt. After Costello had bowed out, Genovese stepped into the role of Mafia boss. While most accepted this change, there were some mobsters who maintained their loyalty to Costello. One of these mobsters was Anthony Carfano. Carfano was deeply loyal to Costello and had made his way into the gambling scene in South Florida. After the attempt on Costello's life, Carfano flew to New York all the way from Florida to meet with Costello and show his support, which infuriated Genovese, the new family boss. After this display, Genovese ordered Strollo to take Carfano out. Strollo arranged a meeting with Carfano and a woman whom they both knew named Janice Drake, a former model and wife of comedian Alan Drake. While at this dinner meeting, Carfano had offered to give Drake a lift home once the evening was done, and she agreed. In the middle of the meeting, Carfano received a phone call. Law enforcement tends to suspect that this was Frank Costello calling to warn him that he had walked straight into the lion's den, but we'll likely never know. What we do know, according to this story, is that when Carfano returned, he told Strollo that he had to go on urgent business, so he and Drake left the meeting. That was the last time Strollo ever saw them alive. The next time they were seen was when they were found dead in the car from bullet wounds to the head, 45 minutes later, near the LaGuardia airport. This is typically the story that gets told regarding Carfano's murder, although there are some other versions. It's believed that Strollo had a gunman placed in the backseat of Carfano's car to kill him when he left the meeting. It's strongly assumed that Strollo was involved in the drug trade, although he would never be charged with the crime. The reason for this assumption is because Strollo's longtime boss Genovese and longtime underling Joe Valachi were both convicted on federal drug charges in 1959. After Valachi was released on bail, he failed to show up for the trial. This meant that he would be forced to be a criminal on the run or be forced to turn himself in. He had planned on being the former, but Strollo convinced him to do the latter. Valachi agreed and turned himself in. When Genovese was convicted of his drug charges, he wound up in the same prison as Valachi. It was at this point that Genovese began to suspect that Valachi, Vincent Morrow, another Strollo soldier, and perhaps Strollo himself were traitors. Genovese believed that Strollo had instructed Moro and Valachi to become turncoats and rat him out to the feds. Some reports even maintain that Strollo was in secret meetings with the Mafia Commission orchestrating this takedown of Genovese. Genovese was no darling of the Mafia Commission due to his tendency mostly to kill first and strategize later. Other theories are less harsh towards Strollo and tend to believe that Genovese ordered his murder not because he had switched sides, but because he had cut Genovese out of some of the narcotics profits. This point is where many Mafia enthusiasts and historians disagree. What do you think? Do you think Strollo turned against Genovese out of greed when he realized that federal law enforcement was coming down hard on their drug operations or that he had plotted against him all along? Not to influence your opinion, but I would be remiss if I left out a quote from Carl Safakis in his book, The Mafia Encyclopedia. Quote, Within the councils of the underworld, it was no secret that Bender's loyalty was always for sale to the highest bidder. 
he changed colors and sides like a chameleon. It is often believed that the Lachi's decision to go all in on spilling the beans of the Mafia organization started when he realized that Genovese considered him a traitor, although he had likely already shared some information with the feds prior. It was after Genovese had this revelation about Bellacci that the orders were floated out to take Strollo off the board. On the morning of April 8, 1962, Anthony Strollo left his New Jersey mansion and, according to some reports, got into a vehicle with an unidentified associate. He told his wife before he left, I'm only going out for a few minutes. Well, those few minutes turned into hours, hours turned into days, days to weeks, weeks to months, and months to years. Antonio Strollo was never seen or heard from again. No body has ever been recovered, and the mystery of his disappearance remains unsolved to this day. His disappearance is not without theories, however. It's widely accepted that Genovese called for the hit, but who actually carried it out? Harold Konigsberg, one of the top hitmen for the Bonanno family's New Jersey crew, would offer that he was involved and knew exactly where Strollo's body was. However, Konigsberg had offered this out of an attempt to gain concessions and leniency for his own sentencing so the federal agents didn't play along. Konigsberg had suggested that Strollo's body was in a mafia graveyard with the bodies of other missing mobsters who would actually be found at that chicken farm location outside of Lakewood, New Jersey. The discovery of these other victims per Konigsberg's direction is what gives this theory credibility. Despite Strollo's body never being found there, many believe the body was moved. Another theory is that Ruggiero Boyardo, another high-ranking New Jersey mobster, was responsible for the killing. He was caught on FBI wiretapes bragging about how he had killed Tony Bender. This is frequently dismissed as some sort of mafia fisherman's tale just trying to add to one's legend, as mobsters are so apt to do. The truth is, we may never know what happened to Antonio Strollo. I hope you've enjoyed this episode of Racket Reviews, trying to get our hands around the notorious slippery Anthony Strollo. Strollo was not a loyal mobster by any stretch of the imagination, but his ability to make money and bend things to his will did make him a valuable asset for the family. Make sure to let me know in the comment section below or on Facebook and Twitter what you think about Anthony Strollo. Also, don't forget to utilize that comment section in social media to let me know about who or what you would like to see covered next. I always love hearing from you and I'm always happy to investigate. Make sure to like, subscribe, and click notifications to get more Mafia content sent directly to your sub box. Ciao.